So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the simple, first simple talk of the Easter term. And we're very pleased to have with us uh, Dr. Luke McDonough today. And Luke is uh, teaches at the London School of Economics. Um, he published recently, well, quite recently, yeah, 2021, a book reforming, performing copyright law, theater, and authorship. Um, and at the moment, he's working on the issue basically of music and copyright uh, and just looking into the question generally to see whether it would merit a, a, a full book. Uh, yeah. And we're lucky to have him here talking about some of the things that he's come across in his research. So I'll turn it over to Luke. And of course, there'll be questions at the end. So there's a QA. and a if you're, if you're in the audience, we'll take it from you. But if you're online, put your questions into the Q&A. Okay, thank you, Luke. So first of all, thanks to, to Jennifer and the faculty for inviting me. Um, I've had to ask for, for your patience. This was originally scheduled for November and then had to be canceled due to illness and then was scheduled for March and had to be canceled due to strikes. So this is third time lucky we finally, finally got there. Now, the only consequence of that um, that really matters is that when I submitted the the proposal to do the talk on this topic of recent case law. The cases that I'm talking about were still quite recent and they're now a year old. So that's in part because there's been a kind of six month delay in, in this talk taking place. Um, but there is a stroke of good fortune in that one of the main cases I'm gonna talk about today involves Ed Sheeran and he's in court again this week in New York. So there is an opportunity towards the end of my discussion of the UK case, talk a little bit about that US case, and in particular, what the consequences might be of um, the outcome of, of that case. But to give a, an overview of the Chokri and Sheeran dispute that was heard at the High Court last uh, April, May, what we're talking about here is a dispute between two contemporary sovereigns, Sammy Switch, Sammy Chokri, who is a young British artist, not nearly as well known as Ed Sheeran, but reasonably well known within the British scene. And of course, Ed Sheeran, who is world famous, very wealthy, sells millions of albums, even in this digital streaming age, has won Grammys and Brit Awards and sells out tours. So it was a kind of David and Goliath battle in the High Court. And, you know, spoiler alert, Goliath won. And my argument <coughs> today is that it's a very good thing that Goliath won. So in this particular situation, I'm, I'm pro uh, Goliath, I'm pro Ed, not just because he's a fellow redhead. Uh, on the facts of the case, I think he deserved to win. and I'm gonna explain why. So the case involved two songs, one song by Sammy Switch called Oh Why, and the famous song by Ed Sheeran, Shape of You, which was already a big hit by the time uh, the litigation commenced. And it was actually Sheeran who initiated the, uh, the case seeking a declaration of non-infringement, which is interesting because Chokri had contacted PRS and essentially said, I have an interest in this song, so you need to add me to the register. PRS suspended all the royalty payments while the dispute was playing out and Sheeran decided to ask for the declaration of non-infringement. And the substance of the case concerned a very short sequence of four notes, which was known in the song OY as the main hook of OY. It's something along the lines of OY, 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 very, very simple ascending scale. And a very similar phrase, again, four notes, is also found in the Ed Sheeran song with, instead of it being oh why, it being oh why, oh why, oh why, oh why, which is a bridge section between the verse and chorus of the song Shape of You. So we do have two parts 
that were arguably very, very similar. And hence, you know, this didn't get thrown out at the summary stage, it went to full trial. Um, nobody could have predicted entirely what the result will be. Um, you know, we'd seen in the United States, and I'll talk a little bit more about US law later on, that there have been some erratic decisions over the last 10 years in US copyright. It wasn't um, known really what the courts would do in the UK. We hadn't had a big music copyright dispute for a long, long time. You know, one of the, the major ones before this was Coffee and Warner in 2005, which involved vocal inflections. Before that, a lot of the cases from the 90s actually settled. So Oasis settled three separate copyright cases during the 90s that we know about. Um, because they had taken a lot of their melodies from the, the Ruttles, from the New Seekers, from Gary Glitter. So all three of those cases were settled out of court in the favor of the artists who, who took the case against them. But you have to really go back to 1987, to the Van Gelis case about Chariots of Fire, to really find a full judgment that really digs into the issues as well as the Ed Sheeran case does. And, you know, given that we had this period where we didn't get a huge amount of case law and most case law was happening in the United States or cases were settling in the UK, we couldn't have predicted what the outcome would be. And in the, in the meantime, of course, we had had <coughs> infringement cases in other areas of copyright. So we had the famous Da Vinci Code case in the case of literary works. We've had cases um, on computer software and, and video games and all sorts of things. Um, but it, it was a very good opportunity for the courts to set out how the law of infringement works in the context of music. And luckily, Zaccaroli, <coughs> Judge Zaccaroli, did I think a very good job of doing that and of providing appropriate guidance to lawyers about how to apply the infringement test in the context of a musical dispute. And so what is that test? Well, the first element is that you need to have had access to the song in order to have infringed it. Now that access in some cases will be very obvious. If the song has been a number one hit and is very well known, that access can be implied or might, <coughs> might even be conceded by the artist who is accused of infringement. In this case, however, the song by Sammy Switch was not that well known. It had been, you know, at the time that the, that the, the um, Shape of You came out in 2017. The song by Sammy Switch had been um, viewed only about between 15 to 20,000 times, I think, on YouTube. Um, it hadn't been a major hit. The lawyers for Sammy Switch argued that <coughs> they had mutual friends in common with Ed Sheeran who would have passed the song to Ed Sheeran. And this all played out in the courtroom. Ed Sheeran denied this. And he made the point about how many thousands of songs are uploaded every day to Spotify, to YouTube. He can't be expected to keep abreast of everything that's going on in the music scene. And the judge seemed very swayed by what Sheeran was saying on that point of access. The judge was not persuaded that Sheeran had ever heard the song by Sammy Switch. However, those of you who are copyright experts in the audience or copyright students will know that <coughs> that's not necessarily the end of the story. If the songs are sufficiently similar, then access can be implied and inferred from the fact that the songs are so similar. In other words, simply because access was not proven did not end the story. 
because copying can be conscious, but it can also be subconscious. And it's long been a part of UK law and US law that you don't have to copy deliberately if you do so as in the case of George Harrison in the US dispute in the 1970s over My Sweet Lord, where you're found to have copied subconsciously without meaning to, that can still result in infringement. So the judge went on to consider whether there was sufficient similarity between the two cases. In other words, even if there was no evidence Sheeran had ever heard the song, it couldn't be completely ruled out. Even if he'd only heard it once, it might have implanted in his brain somehow. And it may have then <coughs> come out into the shape of you. And what the judge did then was to take quite a forensic examination of the two musical works. And if you read the judgment in full, you get the impression that Judge Zaccaroli really understands music which is fantastic to see from a, from a judge because you don't always get the sense, apart from Richard Arnold, of course, um, that judges always do understand the way that music works. So what you have in the judgment is the um, various musical parts transposed into the same key, reproduced in sheet music, so that you can take a visual assessment of the notes. Even if you don't read music, you can see the similarity of the pattern between the two songs. But the songs were also played in full in court so that the assessment could be made. And Ed Sheeran brought his guitar to court to perform, which is not that unusual. You know, one of the things that I've been doing over the past few months is looking into at the history of music copyright and, you know, it, people bring pianos into the courtroom. John Fogarty has brought guitar into the courtroom. Apparently George Harrison did as well in his case in the 1970s. So it is, it's not necessarily unusual to have a musical performance as part of the trial. And I, I suspect Ed Sheeran will do this again in the current US trial. So the jury will have a private performance, um, whether they like it or not, that they're getting it. Um, so, it. so in this particular case, the judge had to take all of this evidence into account. The written sheet, the sound recordings, and the live performance by Sharon. And then you had the musical testimony, of course, of experts about... <laughs> The, the, similar, the alleged similarity or not between the two songs. So a whole re, um, kind of reams and reams of evidence was taken in this case. And it's clear from, from reading the judgment that Zaccaroli understood that these were all different ways of representing music in writing, in recording, in performance. Music is an art form that is contained in many different uh, ways. And the, the upshot of this assessment of, you know, is there a substantial part that has been taken from one song and transposed into the other, the classic qualitative test in the UK? Um, did you take part of the intellectual creation of the other artist? You know, that core question was what was guiding um, the, the judge here. What he said was that if you isolate the parts, undoubtedly, they are common. They are pretty much the same. So if you stop there, and if, I think if, you, if it was a judge who didn't fully understand music, the temptation would be to stop there and say, look, the pattern in the musical, in, in the sheet notation is there. It's been cut and pasted. Therefore, there must be infringement. You know, if we were thinking about this in terms of text transposed from one book to another, we might <laughs> stop at that point. If it, you know, if, if we look at InfoPack, if 11 words in sequence could be protected, what here are four notes? Maybe that would be sufficient. But there were two reasons why the judge found this was not um, sufficient to amount to infringement. And the first 
in part related to Ed Sheeran's performance before. There's bound to be a musical interruption at some point. It's perfectly all right. So, you know, if only it was related directly to one of the songs we're talking about, that would have been too perfect. Next time. So Ed Sheeran performed in court. Other songs from musical history that have that four note sequence. One of the songs that he performed was a song called No Diggity by a band called Black Street from the 1990s. Some undergrad students in the room, you know, this is the music of your parents. <laughs> um, and the, the court was quite persuaded, the judge was quite persuaded by the fact that this four note sequence is there in other songs that predate both of the songs that were in dispute. It is after all, a four note ascending part of the pentatonic scale. So even though it was there in both songs, the court was not convinced that this part was actually part of the real intellectual creation in the sense of, of originality, in the way that that links to the qualitative test for substantial part. And the other thing that Judge Zaccaroli did was to look at <coughs> the context of the song. And if you listen to them back to back, and I only did so after reading the judgment, I wasn't knowledgeable about the Sammy Switch song until then. So I knew that the two songs were in dispute when I listened to them. So I could hear the similarity. But in my view, had I not, had I heard these songs before there was any dispute, I never would have put these two songs together. In my mind. There's many more songs that you would hear on the radio that you might think, oh, that sounds a lot like this other song. That wasn't the case in, to my subject musical appreciation. And one of the reasons for that is that the Sammy Switch song is extremely downbeat. It's a, it's a very kind of lovelorn kind of song. Uh, it's not a dance song. Um, it's, it's quite effective in creating this downbeat mood, but it's, you know, chalk and cheese in, in contrast to Shape of You, which is the upbeat dance song that uh, we've all heard on the radio many, many times. And so the court also took into account that context. And the combination of the fact that this part was not an original sequence to begin with, it was present in other songs. And then the way that, it, you know, if you just took it in isolation, you would see the similarity. If you zoomed out to look at the entirety of the two songs, you could see that there were many significant <laughs> differences. And those contextual differences were also quite important to Judge Zaccaroli's analysis. And so, you know, it's rare in copyright to see a total victory, but Ed Sheeran won this case 5 0. He really did um, win on every count. However, there was a, a, a kind of sting in the tail for him, and it was a rather unusual one. I'm not sure if I've seen this before in a copyright case, because what the judge did after his finding on the facts was to then spend quite a bit of time dwelling on disputes that had already been concluded <coughs> that Ed Sheeran had been involved in. And the reason why these were relevant was that they had been raised by Sammy Switch's lawyer as evidence that Sheeran was a, what was called a musical magpie. And essentially what had happened was there had been at least two occasions in the past where Ed Sheeran had been the subject of copyright <coughs> lit litigation. Um, one of which was taken over the Matt Cardle song, Amazing, um, which was alleged to be very similar to the Ed Sheeran song, Photograph. And the other one, remarkably, was also about Shape of You. 
And this was the song No Scrubs by TLC, again, undergrad students, the music of your parents. Um, and in both of those cases, Ed Sheeran had settled with the parties and had added the names of those songwriters of that song Amazing and of No Scrubs to <laughs> the, the credits of uh, his own songs, thus sharing we don't know by how much of a percentage, but certainly that there's a shared ownership now of those songs between Shear and his co-writers and then the other parties. And so the judge goes through these other disputes. And what he concludes is that he rejects entirely the idea that Sheeran is this musical mag. been too generous at crediting these other artists, these other songwriters. Because what the judge says is that when you analyze Photograph and Amazing, in his view, the melodies of both songs were too generic for there to be a successful infringement action under UK law. That's not exactly a compliment to Ed Sheeran. And it's also a message to him that you shouldn't have settled that case. You should have fought it and you would have won under UK law. And then he comes to the same conclusion with respect to the TLC, no scrubs allegation with regard to shape of view. Now to my ears, again, music is subjective. There is a stronger melodic similarity between no scrubs and shape of view than to the Sammy Switch song or to the prior dispute between Matt Cardle and Ed Sheeran. So I'm not sure I fully agree with Zaccaroli on this point, because the melodies are very reminiscent of, of one another. Nonetheless, there's a plausible case, and Zaccaroli makes it very well, that this is not infringement either. And the message here is very clear, um, that the outcome of the case, number one, under UK law, Musicians have a large breadth of copying that is allowed. If you're copying generic elements of music that are present in lots of different songs, then there's a very uh, high chance that you're not infringing copy by taking those elements and using them again. And if you look into and you read into what he says about the photograph song and amazing and also no scrubs and shape of view the scope for copying of music as part of the songwriting process seems to just get wider and wider and then with his criticism of sheeran for settling those earlier cases you get the second message which is fight these cases do not give in do not settle because all you will do is encourage further infringement claims. So there's a really strong um, policy message in my view to what uh, Zaccaroli has, has done here. And the reason why I think it's a very uh, useful decision for musicians is that in the case of music, having that breadth of space for copying is really important because music is an iterative process. Most pop music is rooted in forms of music that have similar patterns. You know, rock and roll songs are patterned on the blues. A lot of jazz songs are patterned on blues formula. A lot of folk pop songs, melodies come straight out of folk traditions. So there's a lot of copying that is inherent in the songwriting process. A lot of songwriters are aware of that and are quite open about that. And yes, there should be a law against blatant infringement. But to my reading of this case is that unless the copying is of quite original elements, melodic elements, I imagine, and is quite blatant, then you have the space to actually reinterpret, to use elements of music as you see fit. And that fits with the prior case law. 
Even though there's not a huge amount of it, we do have some important precedents. I mentioned the Vangelis case over Chariots of Fire. That was also about four notes over a single chord change and the court found no infringement. If we look at Robertson and Lewis from the 60s about the traditional arrangement of the Scottish folk song, again, the court finds no infringement. There wasn't enough copying between the two arrangements of the same melody. Um, so, you know, the major precedents that we have, East Francis Hunter as well, uh, and Braun, you know, it's very hard, it seems, to prove infringement of musical copying in the context of UK law. And in my view, that's the way it should be. We shouldn't be tightening the law too much because to do so will only encourage quite spurious claims about very small amounts of music. And it's at this point that we get to the current Ed Sheeran speaker. And we have to reach back almost a decade to the Blurred Lines decision, which has been discussed in you know, vast amounts of detail. I'm certainly not going to go through it again. It's been criticized. In my view, it's a problematic uh, precedent. Um, if you read the dissent in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals from 2018 by Ju Justice Nguyen, I think you have a judgment there that is very clear, very much in line with the philosophy of the Zaccaroli judgment in the current Sheeran case. But the majority decision went the other way. And the blurred lines decision seems to have encouraged a lot of what, in my view, are quite spurious copyright claims. You know, if you are interested in music and, mu and the music industry, and you pay attention to music industry, websites, you know, every week it seems as though there's another dispute. Many of them don't come to court, but they're being resolved uh, behind the scenes. Olivia Rodrigo seems to be sued every couple of months, um, often for very small elements of music, short chord sequences, riffs, and so on. Um, you know, Katy Perry was sued and lost at first instance at, at the jury level. The judge overturned that. And then on appeal, the, uh, the, the judge's overturning of the jury decision was upheld. So ultimately, Katy Perry was vindicated. Led Zeppelin were ultimately vindicated in the more recent uh, case about um, Stairway to Heaven. Um, and again, that was over, like the current Ed Sheeran case, over a chord progression. And so when they, we get to the, what's happening now in New York, we have two songs, Let's Get It On and Thinking Out Loud, that follow a very similar harmonic pattern. You could play one over the other reasonably seamlessly because they follow the same harmonic chord structure. However, the melodies to my ears are distinct. Again, to my ears, this is not very blatant copying. It is inherently dangerous to uh, allow a copyright infringement case to proceed in the context of structural elements. You know, there are within pop music, you know, when you have these are both, you know, Ed Sheeran's song has a few more chords because it has a kind of breakdown um, just after the chorus. But by and large, these are four chord songs. And a lot of pop songs are four chord songs. Um, you could play, and there, you know, th th there are stand-up comedians who do this, who play 20 songs in a row, all with, with the same four chords. Because pop music is based on familiarity. It's based on melodies that are in some way new, but also have that sense of familiarity. They're recognizable in that way because some of the chord structures are identical. And Ed Sheeran made that point in court this week. He said, you know, you could, if you're a busker, and Ed Sheeran started out as a busker, you could play Let It Be and go straight into No Woman, No Cry um, without changing any chords. 
And those are not the only songs. There's a great many that you could um, go to. And I'm sure that when it comes to, it, to the defense, when Ed Sheeran gets into the stand, he will play some of those songs. You know, Hurdy Gurdy Man by Donovan is another one of those, you know, same chord pattern. And, you know, much like the, 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 the danger of the, the Blurred Lines case that was pointed out by the dissenting judgment was that this is giving copyright over a group which is very close to you know, key generic elements of music. And if you give a, an exclusive right over those elements, then you're tightening music copyright, um, in my view, way too much because you're restricting what other songwriters can do with, with the music. And, there is a real danger that Ed Sheeran will lose that case. You know, the US law right now is not a model of clarity. We had the blurred lines decision, and then the, there's been this rolling back with the Katy Perry and the uh, Led Zeppelin decisions. My fear is that if Ed Sheeran loses, it opens up the floodgates to even more spurious claims. Now it's not just about little elements of, of melody or bits of bass lines. You know, if everyone starts suing each other over four chords, then, you know, the music industry is going to get tied in knots even more than it already is. So the law in the UK, to my eyes and ears, provides a better model for how to get out of this situation. The dissent in the Blurred Lines appeal decision provides a way of getting out of this problem. Um, but it needs to happen because if it doesn't, then you know, with the corporate ownership of, of, of copyrights increasing, a lot of musicians are selling their copyrights, the temptation to take these cases and try to get quick settlements will only increase. So if we're thinking about the Ed Sheeran decision as a relative model of clarity, we, we now go from the sublime to the ridiculous. I'm switching tack now because I, I wanted to discuss recent case law. So the other case that I'm gonna discuss about UK law is the only fools and Shazam case. Now, if ever there was a case that was a conceptual mess, it's this one. Um, if you read through the IPEC decision, it's very clear that what happened was that the judge had a reasonable inclination that what the only fools dining experience was doing was a violation of the law and should be stopped. And then decided to figure out a way to use IP law to justify that decision to stop what was happening. And unfortunately, the judge chose, you know, ent went entirely down the wrong path in my view, of how to deal with this behavior and made a lot of very strange conceptual decisions along the way. Because as far as I understand it, the parties came to an agreement after the IPEC decision, we didn't get an appeal here, uh, which would have been very useful. Um, so we're, we're, for the moment, we're stuck with this very unwieldy decision. So for those of you who don't know the facts, what had happened here was that an enterprising group of, of young people in London started what they called the Only Fools and Horses dining experience, the Kushti dining experience. And it sounded quite fun. Essentially, that they, they would dress up as the characters from the sitcom Only Fools and Horses, which ran in the 80s and 90s and was very, very popular in Britain. And many people would still recognize the catchphrases, the characters from the sitcom. So people would pay to dine with people performing as the characters of Del Boy and Boise and various other characters from Only Fools and Horses. And you know, they'd, they'd eat together, they'd have fun, and that would be the end of that. 
My suspicion is they weren't making a huge amount of money doing this. Um, it wasn't, uh, it, you know, I didn't, I don't remember seeing this advertised. It, you know, I, I live in London. You know, it wasn't on my radar at all. Um, but obviously, you know, it had this commercial element. They were charging for it. Um, they were running it as a business. Potentially, it could have gotten more, uh, bit, you know, bigger and bigger. So the owners of the rights to the Only Fools and Horses um, TV show, who were themselves planning at the time, and it's now been produced in London, a musical based on the show, decided that they needed to shut down this activity, um, this rival organization, small scale as it was, they saw as potentially a threat to their market. And they also thought there was a risk that consumers would think this was an authorized licensed activity. Now, the natural way in my view, an IP lawyer head to deal with this would have been through passing off. And that was part of the case. The idea that this group were not making it sufficiently clear that this was not a licensed operation. They had no permission to use these characters, these elements of the show in their performances. Um, there doesn't seem to have been a that many trademarks registered here. It was more or less brought under unregistered trademarks passing off. But nonetheless, you know, to me, that would have been the, the natural way that the judge should have gone to analyze this activity. But instead, the judge got bogged down in the question of whether the characters, in particular, that the main character, Del Boy, from the show was a copyright work in himself, in itself, whether the character can be a copyright. And there's never been a definitive statement on this under UK law. Previously, it probably would have been understood that a detailed character could be a substantial part of either a literary or a dramatic work, but a work on its own, is a whole other kind of conceptual understanding. And, you know, again, rather than analyzing this, you know, if you were going to go through the copyright um, philosophy to, to try to deal with this, rather than going through it as, as if this is a work in itself, again, you have to ask yourself, why not just talk about this in terms of whether what has been taken is and sufficiently similar? Is it a substantial part? Is it a matter of infringement? You know, why this focus on identifying the character as a work in, in itself? You know, it, 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 it's, um, it, it's not necessarily the, the, the way that I would have gone about it. I'll say that much. Um, and so the court had took, took on that question that was put to it obviously by the lawyers, but you know, it didn't have to be decided in this way. The court took on this idea that, uh, you know, we should decide whether there can be a, lit a, a literary character here, a literary work. Now that in itself was very, very odd because, you know, people were obviously having fun at these only fools and horses dining experiences, but it's fair to say there was nothing literary happening at those occasions. What was very obviously happening was some kind of performance. And so, you know, this very obviously should have remained within the category of dramatic work one way or the other. And, you know, I think because of the way that evidence was put before the court by the, the, the lawyers on behalf of Shazam, which was based on case law in the US on Sherlock Holmes and in Germany on Pippi Longstocking. So it was in the literary realm that they were looking to to find precedents, but that there could be copyright in a character distinct from the novel itself, the judge fell into that trap of making Del Boy a literary character um, in his own right. And in actual fact, 
what the judge was looking at in terms of, of documents were the scripts, the dramatic works from the TV show. And the judge was looking at how much in terms of lines of dialogue has been taken and, and kind of regurgitated as part of the dining experience. And the combination of reading through those elements and the evidence put before it seems to have pushed the court towards this idea that Del Boy could be a literary work. Um, that was misguided in my view. So I'd like to reframe this case as Judge Luke just for a few minutes um, to put this in terms of three questions. And sticking with dramatic work, first of all, because we're talking about scripts to a TV show and we're talking about performances at a dinner. Nothing literary has happened. The first question should be, was Del Boy as a character an intellectual creation such that he would be a separate work capable of performance under the UK understanding of dramatic work? And the answer to that question in my view as Judge Luke is no. There simply isn't enough that is, that is separable from, of Del Boy that is not contained within the dramatic work itself that you would make into a separate work capable of performance. One of the reasons for that is that most of what Del Boy is doing is in the scripts, lines of dialogue and so on, and therefore, what really matters is the second question. Is performing the character of Del Boy at these dinners an infringement of one or more of the dramatic works, the scripts of Only Fools and Horses? In other words, is the performance of lines of dialogue, catchphrases and so on, a substantial part taken from one or more of those dramatic works. And again, you know, it's a more plausible claim, but I would say probably not. It does seem at the dinners there were some catchphrases used, but there was also a lot of new kind of discussion happening and they were using mannerisms of Del Boy, um, like his misguided use of French and things like that. It's not clear that, there, that enough had been taken from the scripts for that to be an infringement of copyright in the, in the scripts as a substantial part. But that is a more plausible claim at least. And then we get to the third. So assuming that Judge Luke is right and no, no are the answers to those first two questions. The third question then I, I would ask as a judge would be, is this a case of passing off? Is this likely to deceive? Is it trading on the goodwill and so on? And given that there was this competing show that was being developed, you know, whether a dining experience and a musical are truly rivalrous is a tricky question, but I'm willing to go so far as to say that they are broadly in the same category, that people who are fans of the show would be interested in going to both. And on that, I would be more likely to say that this could be a breach of the law of passing off. And so if there is a way to stop this activity, that would be the way to go about it. Finally then, and I'm gonna be very brief because I mainly wanna talk about this conceptual mess. There's also some tricky elements to do with the defenses. So obviously the defenses of parody and pastiche were put forward by the um, defendants and the judge rejected both of these defenses. And it's one of the first times we've seen the UK courts grapple with, with this idea of parody since the Deckman test was advocated at the EU level. And in the court's view here, what was happening was mere imitation and not a criticism or comment on anything happening in the wider world or on the works themselves. And so it didn't meet the standard of parody. 
there's not a lot of discussion of that, but you know, that's not necessarily an incorrect conclusion. Um, it might not fit the parody test of Deckman. Whether it's a pastiche is a trickier question because what they were doing at the dinner was somewhat more akin to a pastiche of the Del Boy character and other characters and elements of the dialogue and so on. They were clearly assembling something which had some originality to it, um, which you know I'm not necessarily against calling a pastiche. I think you could bring it into that activity. And then the question then, so if you do accept that, that it should fall under that category, then the question is, is it truly fair or not? And here the court's view was that given the commercial context and the amount taken, um, this was not fair. And that's to me, not the most um, uh, illogical part of the judgment by any means. It fits pretty much with the conservative attitude that the UK courts generally take to the defences, which is that they're very, very hard to make out. It's very, very hard to show, particularly in a commercial context where you have that element of rivalness, that, that what you're doing is, is, um, is fair. So that element of it may well be in line with UK case law, at least for the time being. But the lack of, there's a lack of detail there and a lack of confidence in the way that, that that's dealt with. So I'm going to conclude with those points. I think we, we essentially have here, you know, these decisions were made around the same time. And we have two very different judicial styles. And to me, one is conceptually very sound in the case of the Ed Sheeran case. And the other one is conceptually very messy. Um, and we'll in my view, probably be overturned if these issues come to a, to a higher court in the UK in the future. So I'm working on these because the, I'm very interested in the creative arts, um, performances, music, theater. So the musical work, the dramatic work, these are concepts in copyright that are very close to my heart. I'm still figuring out exactly what I want to do with my analysis, which is why this has been a useful preparation for me, um, and I'm very interested to hear your thoughts and questions.